<laughs> no, no, she's <laughs> okay. Um, thank you. Um, uh, committee and um, our, our watching public, we have moved um, our, um, our topic to um, H711, which is an act relating to the creation of the Opioid Settlement Advisory Committee and the Opioid Abatement Special Fund. And um, this is really on some level, probably a short um, discussion. Um, uh, it is my understanding um, <coughs> that uh, the Attorney General's office and you had some um, suggested changes in um, the bill, which is fine. Um, and that, that, were, that you talked to uh, legislative council about. And so I was hoping that you could um, ha, um, talk about what it is um, the changes were so that we're not surprised when we see the language, which we're not gonna see yet. We're just trying to understand. Madam Chair, I, I assume that that's directed to me. I apologize. Oh, yeah. No, I'm sorry. Yes, no, yes. Uh, <laughs> yes, no, yes, no. <laughs> I think that means maybe. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, no, Monica, it is, it's, it's, it's directed at you because you, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, the, um, the attorney general's office was not able to, to come. And um, so we have questions and we are fast approaching um, our town meeting recess. And so I wanted to um, try to understand what the, what the suggested changes in terms of what needed to be modified based and, and, and why. Got it. Thank you. Um, so for the record, Monica Hutton, the Chief Prevention Officer for the state of Vermont. Um, if, if it makes sense to the committee, I think what I would like to do is just articulate a few of the things that um, Katie and Josh Diamond and I continue to sort of um, try to clarify. And then maybe yeah. Katie, if you could fill in with the actual, because I, I feel like a lot of this was in response to the attorney general trying to clarify for us how this was gonna work. And we kept trying to translate it into the legislation itself. Okay. That sounds um, good, thank you. Perfect. So uh, I think that the bill is actually in pretty good shape in terms of, um, of where it sits right now, there was, there, were, there was a little bit of clarification that needed to happen in a couple of areas. And, and this is where maybe Katie can get a little bit more specific. Um, we needed to better understand, uh, if you will recall those three different buckets of funding that are flowing in because of this litigation and to be a little bit more clear about which buckets connected to the need to create an advisory council, uh, because not all three do. One, as you will recall, is directly to municipalities, and that one doesn't connect to the advisory council. And actually the state fund, so it was 15% for municipalities, 15% into the state fund, and then 70% of the settlement goes into that abatement fund. The abatement fund connects to the advisory council. The other two do not. And so we've been trying to just um, make sure that the language reflects that because um, it will all be, the legislation will, needs to reflect the way that the settlement is structured. And because we are still learning that, I think that that's where we keep tweaking it. So I apologize if that feels um, frustratingly nitpicky, but we are, trying very hard to do a good job with this bill. So that's the one, one area, and Katie might be able to articulate a little bit more about how we cleaned that up. Um, we don't need to know the exact language right okay, now. Okay, okay, that's, so that's just a really global. The other piece that we were trying to clarify was how the actual um, process works in terms of utilizing the Department of Health as the single state entity and how it will, it will flow from the National Settlement Fund Administrator, who is a, you know, a person that will be hired 
through the settlement to administer these dollars to this to all of the states that are involved. So how that flow works. Um, and so we tried to put in some language, I believe, to try to clarify that flow. One area that I know Katie wanted me to articulate to you out loud because it was coming clear to us as we were working through this is that the timing is a little bit um, delayed um, because we are putting into place the, the use of the budget cycle to ensure that the Department of Health can create a plan, um, submit that plan to the administrator, get tentative approval on that plan, and then build that plan and the associated dollars into the budget, which then walks through the department, the governor, and then the general assembly. What we realized um, is that if money is available to the state in April, we will probably not be able to walk through that whole process until I get confused about my fiscal years, fiscal year 24, unless we were to use budget adjustment. Katie, does that sound right? Because I think that that was the light bulb that went on for the both of us. And we thought, oh, we need to just say this out loud to make sure the committee understands that. I still think the process makes sense. And I think it's important that everybody has the opportunity to weigh in. I just wanted to make sure that I articulated that because as we realized it, it, it took us aback a little bit. I don't think it's bad to, to move a little bit more slowly. The money won't go away. It will simply be there and it will be spent far more intentionally with a little bit of time. But I did want to make sure that the committee was aware of that. So, um, okay. Do we know for sure that money will come in April? Um, no. The, okay. the, the wonderful thing about this piece of legislation and the settlement is that we don't know very much for sure because it's still not entirely finalized. But okay. my best guess would be that we will see funding to the state anywhere between April and June. Um, and this is where the Attorney General's office has a much, you know, a much stronger finger on the pulse of all of that information. And they are in, in kind of constant communication as they look to finalize the settlement. But that is my best guess. It would make sense. And I don't know if it needs different language that the, I mean, that um, the budget adjustment process um, if it comes early. And um, the other thing, I guess, and I, I sort of, I look to, to the other, maybe the thing to, 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 um, to think about <laughs> um, um, is uh, we pass this legislation, the governor signs the legislation it is um, in, in July, unless you can get the Senate to work very fast and passing it earlier and the governor signs it earlier or whatever. Um, but I guess um, there is, a from time to time I have seen, you know, us put things in, you know, spend it before we have it. <clears throat> I'm not suggesting we do that. I mean, I, I guess I'm trying to understand and maybe that is something for us to noodle on um, or understand better. Um, with the ARPA funds, we, we wrote a whole bill around how to spend the ARPA funds and, we had, and, and they had to get approved by ARPA Central. Before we could, you know, I mean, they, you know, they, they had to be an approved, whatever. Um, I think part of the point, though, on um, committee that um, uh, 
Ms. Hutt is making is that uh, we would not be able, the, you know, the earliest we'd be able to maybe, you know, spend it would be in, in terms of the budget adjustment. So we, would, we wouldn't be able, if the money came in April, May, or June, we, um, the state might not be able to fund it yet. Yeah. Um, one of the things, this is actually sort of referencing your first part of your comment. Um, I know that <clears throat> we did this with um, some previous um, CRF monies, coronavirus relief monies. We, um, we appropriated general fund and then backfilled it with CRF funds when we received those CRF funds. Um, I, it's, it's sort of relating to what you're saying. It's like, you know, you could appropriate funds for these purposes. Um, and then when we receive the, out of the general fund, and then when we receive the money, you can, um, they can be repaid by the, um, unless that would be considered supplanting or something like that. Right, right. Those. Well, I, and I think the, um, that's right. And the thing that would, that would be that's different is that we have said that there needs to be an advisory um, group that provides recommendations uh -huh. and that does not exist yet. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, timing is an issue. Timing is an issue. And, um, I, but, but maybe not a bad issue. Um, I think it necessarily is a, a bad issue, Madam Chair. I feel like um, it took me a while to wrap my head around it, but I, I feel like this is the process that's most comfortable to all of us and gave, you know, the advisory council time to form and to, and to actually do some thinking and some advising, um, allows the department to, to put together a plan, you know, utilizes the settlement administrator, which we have to do, um, lets the governor look at it and then comes to you as a recommend for discussion. It's a little slower that we might have hoped, but I don't necessarily think that that means it's not good. I feel like it's a very good, thoughtful, intentional use of those dollars. And the dollars will be around in some way, shape or form for the next 18 years. So I would much rather have a process that feels inclusive and connected and gives us the opportunity to think carefully versus speeding it through. So I, I, I for myself personally, I'm comfortable with, I think that the administration is comfortable with this. If you are comfortable, I don't, I don't think it's a problem that we need to fix necessarily. I just wanted to make sure that, that you heard it because as I, as I said, for Katie and I, it was, it was a little bit of a revelation as we backed into it. Okay. I mean, that's something for us to noodle on. And I mean, whether you have, I don't know if anyone um, on committee has um, an immediate thought that they want to, or, you know, or concern about continuing on the path that we have started. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I think um, hearing uh, uh, the chief prevention officer <laughs> uh, talk about sort of the potential timeline uh, where possibly these funds wouldn't be dedicated until fiscal year 24 um, does seem like a, a ways out. And I think it would just, if that's the, um, if that is the absolute case that we're working with, I would just want to make sure that the council that we're putting together, you know, that we're taking that time to really create strong, informed recommendations, because I do believe that's the that's the spirit of uh, this process. And so I think us taking a close look at uh, who sits on that uh, council is probably a, a good idea, so that we can make the most out of what uh, is sort of a limited limited resource year by year that we will be receiving through this settlement. So. Where can we really get the most benefit from those dollars? When you think 18 years, this, <laughs> that you want this to be an excellent, strong um, process that's backing it up so that you don't have to go in and amend or, you know, that's a long time. I know, but you know better. What was tobacco when it started? 
A long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Um, thank you. And um, were there other areas? there were any other substantive areas we've been trying to clean up the language um, and again it, 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 this all will be somewhat dependent on how the settlement fund administrator decides to function so there may be some twists and turns that we didn't anticipate but I think as to the rest of it and I'm looking at Katie for confirmation it was really just trying to use consistent language all the way through and naming things the way that they needed to be named is yeah. there anything else that you can imagine that you can remember that we were? I think a big part of it was using the right terminology for the national settlement and the national administrator who we have to, you know, ask to approve the plan um, is a big part of it. And then really understanding which bucket of money this chap subchapter is talking about and being very clear about how the money will flow and that it requires a request from the health department that has to be approved, a, a preliminary a plan approval before the, the money can leave um, that national settlement account. So really reflecting what the settlement requires in terms of how the money flows. That's um, helpful, thank you. Um, And we are only stop one. Um, when, when we um, introduced this bill, it was um, the first, uh, until I intervened and it got sent back to committee, it was gonna go to appropriations. So it may go to appropriations anyway. Um, but in any case, it will go to the Senate. So as, as, as um, you and um, Attorney General Diamond learn more things, I think that you know, there, there will be opportunity to make it um, more reflective of what it needs to, uh, to do um, in, ter you know, in terms of that. Um, we have had um, some of us have gotten emails and Monica, if you can't answer this right now, maybe um, you could inquire of Josh, uh, of the, Josh, the Attorney General, Jeff, Josh Diamond, and get um, responses back to, to the committee. Um, the list of, um, I know the settlement talked about, this is the, uh, the limitation that is a limitation and maybe not a limitation, but when in terms of where things go, the bucket of choices, um, if I want to say, um, can we add to that? <coughs> um, I know that we talked about that as a committee the last time that Josh and I were both um, meeting with you and, and um, my sense of the response to that is that the buckets, if you look at the legislation, are, are quite broad. Um, so I, I feel like there's not, I would be hard pressed to imagine very much that is directed to substance use disorder that wouldn't <laughs> fall into some of those buckets. They are, they are pretty huge when you look at them. Um, right. I mean, so, so I, I guess, I mean, the, the question is sort of more specific. I mean, your interpretation, which might be my interpretation, is that the buckets and the descriptors are quite broad. And organization X that comes in and does a, it would fit under one of those buckets, but it's very specific. And they want to be, have their type of service be very specifically mentioned. Um, is that a choice we have um, to choose or not choose to call out certain types of organizations or, is, or, or not? So that's what part of- Could I help I'm not with that saying, I'm not saying we will do it, but I don't wanna give an answer saying we can't do it 
if, if it's more, you no, know, we've chosen not to, or we've chosen to. Yes, um, Ms. McClinn. <sighs> Thank you. So this issue, um, we discussed this specifically with Josh at our meeting because I was curious too. When um, when this language was drafted, I stuck very closely to what was in the settlement in terms of the language, and I asked him how flexible we should feel in committee to um, to amend that language or you know put our own kind of Vermont approach on that language and. I felt that he was discouraging that and that he was um, en encouraging kind of sticking with that language unless there was something that was really unclear or, or worded really poorly um, to, to really try to stick with that. But then I think the flip side is he felt that, well, we should probably stick with the language that was in the settlement, that um, it could probably be interpreted fairly broadly. Um, so you know, when you're looking at that subsection B in the special fund language, the language is very broad. I think it's meant to be interpreted broadly, but in terms of going in and maybe naming a specific organization or a specific type of service, um, my instance, sense is that he would be a little wary of that. Right. Okay. Because I mean, for instance, I think there's something broadly about education. Mm hmm and this committee loves childcare and early childcare, early care and education. So, you know, I mean, part of me would like to know what would be the harm of saying education and then the next line being preschool or the next line being childcare centers. Uh, and I, I, I'm not, um, I'm not proposing this, but these are the types of questions that we, and I'm trying not to use the examples of the questions we've been, I've been given. I'm trying to find out, um, I wanna give an honest answer. If, if there's, a, you know, um, and then when things come, we can discuss it, but I don't wanna off the top of my head go, no, we have to stick with that. Oh, I would agree with well, I mean, that. I mean, that, one, that, of the, one of the things, and Kelly's not here, and I think we <laughs> talked about it when we first brought it up, was um, there's been a, a, um, a, a request to add after school programs. And I think we talked about that, but I, my memory is we talked about that. And the, the response was, well, the interpretation that would fit under education. Um, so it's, I don't know, I'm just, you know, is, is there, is there a, probably not, this is lawmaking, um, <laughs> um, it, you know, it, it, is there a clear response or is this a decision that we get to make? agree with Katie that, it, that the encouragement from the attorney general was to stick with the language of the settlement. Um, recognizing that it, what, how we can be flexible in what we propose and we will still need to get that approved. The role of the settlement administrator is to check that anything that we suggest falls in their opinion within the scope of the settlement agreement. So we, if we started adding um, things that were um, too different than the language in the settlement, we might be setting up a conflict between our own Vermont law and what the settlement administrator will ultimately approve. Um, and then that would become, I, I would imagine that that would be, would be pretty awkward and kind of hard to negotiate. So I think that um, Josh, uh, the attorney general's office recommended that we stick with the language of the settlement in Vermont law recognizing that the flexibility is in our interpretation and then in what the administrator will in fact allow. And there is language. I mean, I'm just thinking of the after school example, but in the subsection B, there's a whole list of, um, you know, different um, things that are acceptable expenses. And one of them is implementing other evidence-based or evidence-informed programs or strategies to support 
prevention, harm reduction, treatment, or recovery. Um, so that seems fairly broad that if there is, you know, an evidence-based or evidence-informed after-school program aimed at prevention or harm reduction, that, uh, you know, that would probably be uh, an acceptable use of those types of funds. Thank you. Um, committee, uh, my, um, <clears throat> my, my hope is that when we come back from town meeting recess, that um, if that, that Wednesday morning we could vote this out. Um, you know, um, that Tuesday we could see, you know, we, we could get, get the newer, get the amendments. Um, and uh, so that would be, and, and to move it along um, to its next step. Um, so my question is, do you, who, who, who do you want to, who else do you want to hear from? Or what end, what additional information will you, will you need? in order to feel like you're ready to do that. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I think some of the questions coming up for me um, are related to uh, who sits on the advisory board while understanding that we don't want to expand out and out. Um, one thing that struck me was that they include like um, somebody who provides either treatment or recovery services. And that seems like a pretty broad you know, a uh, diverse feel. Um, so if we were to call that out, and then I think just, yeah, the, the various, um, uh, we have uh, the commissioner of health, uh, which is straightforward, but, um, you know, we also have the commissioner of mental health on there. Uh, we've heard from Monica, chief prevention officer. Um, and I think uh, maybe hearing from just a few more of the people that uh, we expect to have sit on the board and have a major presence as far as what they what they see their role as. Okay. Oh, I, I'm sorry. As you said that it made, it reminded me that we did hear from the League of Cities and Towns and they will, um, uh, in terms of the local um, appointees, they don't want to, it's not, they don't feel it's their role to appoint the assistant judge, that there is, some kind of assistant judge association, association of some sort. and so that um, um, to to change that. So so to yeah. change that, and um, you know, I I remember there has to be equal numbers of local to um, to the other, and. Uh, not to discourage you because I'm not. Um, but something we have to think about is if we, if we do, um, and there may be real value in splitting, um, that'd be two people. Treatment is very different than prevention. Um, we'll need to up the number of, of local. Or, or take away one of the ones that- Or take away, or take away someone else. Um, so is the bill that is on our web page right on our page yeah. is that the most updated version that is now? the most up, that, that is the bill that the bill that is on our um on our committee page is the bill as introduced mm -hmm. it is the most up to date version um in conversations you know outside of committee as people are noodling how to make this better some um, or more responsive, these questions came up. Hence, I asked um, the chief prevention officer to come and sort of outline for us what they were. Mm -hmm. um, and if one of them seemed really odd, I was looking to, or it didn't make sense or people had questions, I was sort of looking for committee members to sort of say that. Um, I have not heard that. So, you know, Katie would have some direction to 
try to move forward with that. Um, just trying, I'm, I was just wondering if we are changing it at all, then I want to make sure that over break, I have, that it's, I go to the website and update myself before we walk in on Tuesday morning. To well, I mean, I, I think, talk about it. yeah, no, um, um, I think that um, that's why I sort of put it to Wednesday because um, uh, in terms of these amendments and do we want to do it? Oh, do we want to have a clean, I mean, they're only, ultimately, is it easier to have a clean a, rather than an amended version? I think, Katie, that's what we're going to want would be a strike all even though the changes aren't that much. Um, and I do appreciate, um, I wanna say again, um, represent um, Whitman, that I, I appreciate your calling out that one section um, of who was on the committee. And um, we can try to have um, some folks come in, yeah. Might I suggest uh, folks from the Comstat team in Burlington, just because it is a collaborative effort of okay. local law enforcement, government officials, medical professionals, seeing what what's working with that in addressing the opioid crisis. I know it's Burlington and Trenton County, so if there's another one in the state, open to other options. <laughs> um, but just seeing, do they have everyone that they feel like they need at the table, and that might help us to see who should okay. be part of this group. Um, if you if you would give the contact information to Julie, or, or, or you already have, I have not. <laughs> I'm just don't get. I'm not going to put the cart in front of the horse man chair. <laughs> <laughs> um, who else might we want to um, uh, hear from? I, I would think maybe the. Um... Vermont Association of Mental Health and Recovery. Okay. What about the, some of the designated agencies? Okay. Um, the head of the designated aid, the, 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 the probably an Vermont Care Partners. How about, is that with that, you know, the, the umbrella, Vermont Care Partners is the- Yeah, sort of umbrella organization. Yeah. So. Um, and, and, if, if some of them don't want to come in, but want to send a letter, that would be fine, I think as well. Um, what about the education component and what Kelly was concerned about the app that could speak to them, to the after school? I guess one of the things that I'm wondering yes. about Madam Chair is uh -huh. it seems like there's a sort of fairly defined activities, fairly defined eligible areas for spending this money. Yeah. Um, and not that I don't want to hear from all of these people, but <laughs> I am just, um, it is likely that they will come and say, oh, but could we do this? Or could we do can that? We or can, we, can we change this? And well, um, I think it's, um, sorry to interrupt. Um, but maybe important that they're testifying on who sits on the panel, not necessarily recommendations okay. for how the money will be spent. Okay, then, then we should be specific when we ask them to testify <laughs> um, that we would like you to testify with regard to section, whatever the section number is. I know um, I'm finding it now. Uh, I have it open here. Um, uh, with regard to... <clears throat> Like, I mean, we should presume hear the commissioner say that they're okay with being the lead agency, which I'm presuming that our chief prevention officer already knows that, but- um, but, but a letter from the, from letter the commissioner from, right. might be helpful. Monica, uh, Ms. Hutt. <laughs> Shall I ask for that to be submitted, Madam Chair? Yes, please. Um, um, in, in fact, unless people really want to hear from the Commissioner of Mental Health. Um, something similar from her. Something similar yeah. from her would be fine. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, 
a group that we don't often hear around opioids is older Vermonters. And uh, I just got some statistics from my intern who's been doing some research based on this. And between 2012 and 2019, there was a 600% increase in individuals over the age of 65 receiving MAT. So we may want to hear- Baby boomers getting older. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So maybe here um, from the Department of Health, they have a person whose job it is to basically work with older Vermonters around substance use disorder. Are you wondering if we should, if, if um, just what? Uh, are you wondering if, if, if the focus on, if there needs to be, if, if some of the advisory council, someone on the advisory council should have a focus on older Vermonters? At least we should talk about it, or at least someone should be thinking about that as we're um, discussing uh, what this advisory council will be uh, addressing, just as long as it's part of the discussion, doesn't necessarily have to be someone directly targeted, you know, to that, but someone should be thinking about that. So I wonder if the former commissioner of Dale oh. has any... Uh... <laughs> Happens to be right here. <laughs> <laughs> has any thoughts um, about that? Um, it will certainly be no surprise to anybody to hear that I am very appreciative of Representative Noyes raising that. Um, I, I do think it's a huge issue. Um, we did just, I'm happy to say, uh, appoint Charles Gurney, who is the gentleman who actually has a position at BDH and Dale, it's, oh, it's a shared position to focus on substance use in older Vermonters, to the Substance Misuse um, Prevention Advisory Council. So now he's a uh, sitting member of that group, which I'm very excited about. That's um, it. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, so, th so that group will appoint somebody. Um, I think that the challenge with the advisory council is really how, um, how big do you want it to be? Because I think that there are lots of voices that can and should be represented. And so, you know, one of the strategies I know um, we've used internally in state government is to design a committee and then maybe articulate who we want them to reach out to as part of their deliberative process, because it, it can be, it can be huge. Um, so, so I don't know if that's a strategy or, or, or a way of threading the needle a little bit. Um, it, it worries me just because every time you add somebody as, as, Chairwoman, who noted, you're at you're you're adding two people. Every person that you add adds two people, because you need right. to maintain that balance. Um, yeah, I don't necessarily think we need to add another person. It's just as long as that comes into the discussion and doesn't fall through the cracks. That's my concern. There is no education. Yes. Um. It just what uh what. Ms. White, uh, Ms. Hutt was just speaking to, um, I'm just wondering if that should be a, um, one of the duties of this advisory committee is to coordinate with the group that you just spoke of that's got the big long name. Um, <laughs> because they're both, dealing with, they're both dealing with similar issues and it, um, I know that this one is required and there's a certain you know, um, way it has to be configured in order to meet the requirements of the settlement. So I understand the need to have two, but it really feels like they should definitely should be explicit about them working together. Okay, um, mm -hmm. I, and I'm, I'm and I'm going to look to. I think that's a good idea. I'm going to look to um, Ms. Hutt and have you coordinate with um, Josh Diamond in the next um, week. Um, there's a section on the advisory council that says powers and duties. Mm -hmm. And um, it says, you know, shall receive testimony and advice on the, on the following for the purpose of providing recommendations. And um, <clears throat> to think if there is a way of perhaps um, Shoring that up a bit more, 
um, without getting so specific that somebody and some group is going to um, say, but what about us? Yeah. yeah. For instance, maybe are you referring to number three at the top of page five that references marginalized populations? Are you thinking in that, or are you rethinking that sort of broadly? I, mean, I was thinking that broadly. broadly. I was thinking that broadly yeah. because, I mean, I, I want to say um, my guess is that um, marginalized populations probably have more to do with people in poverty and people who are not white. My point exactly. Right. I mean, so th there's that. Um, and um, all the Vermonters are marginalized population as well, but it's not, wouldn't necessarily. <laughs> come to people's mind minds, right the right terminology exactly exactly so i mean i, I was not um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh to, um representative mcfawn thank you uh thank you madam chair um in, in relation to who else should we be talking to or listening to um on, on page 11, um, it, it talks now about treating incarcerated populations specifically and monies from this fund to be used for that. Um, I'm wondering why that would be in there and not in the monies that come to the state. I don't think the state would use their money to deal with uh, people in the corrections population or the incarcerated population. Representative, I believe that that language came directly out of the settlement. I'm again, I'm looking at Katie to make sure that I'm right. I'd have to go back and double check. I'm not certain. Um, if it's in the special, yes, the special, the incarcerated persons is in the special fund that came from exhibit E. So yes, that did come right from the, uh, um, the um, language. So um, um, I, I might ask um, Representative McFawn's question a different way. If the settlement says these and only these are areas where you can spend you potentially can spend the money. Can we as a state cross something out and not put it in our legislation? Not that we would, would do that, but that's the, on some level, the import of Representative McVaughn's question. I, I think that this would be a great question for Josh. My okay. sense. My, my, my sense is that, again, we are signing the settlement agreement and this is what the settlement agreement reads. So I think by signing it as a state, aren't, aren't we agreeing to it? Can we not agree to something that we are agreeing? Maybe this is for Katie. Can we not agree to something that we are, can we not in law, in legislation, agree to something that we've already agreed to as a state in signing the settlement agreement? I think a big part of it is what happens in practice. And I think that's the issue you raised. If we're telling the advisory committee, you can use the funds for these reasons and they're developing a plan based on what's in legislation, then they go to submit the plan and the plan um, administrator is not looking at our legislation, that is irrelevant to the plan administrator. They're looking at what was in the settlement. And if the two don't match, then we're, Vermont still isn't drawing that money, even if our legislation says that's an acceptable fund. I, I guess what I'm saying is just because we say it, it so, I think in practice, when um, the advisory committee puts in its plan, health department tries to um, give that to the administrator and, and seek approval, we might not get approval for that purpose unless it sort of falls under one of the general categories that are covered by the settlement. So um, let me take it in a different way. The settlement agreement is broader than what is in state law. So what we send is going to 
in theory, meet the criteria because the things are in there. But there's some aspects of where the settlement agreement says you can spend money and we don't want to. Um, can we, can, can, can a state narrow? And so, um, Ms. Hutt, that would be another question for um, Josh Diamond, who will be very sorry that he was unable to meet. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask and you can tell him that he can he can he too can watch this. <laughs> it started at 145. Didn't it? Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um I'm kind of putting together two and two, and I might be getting five or three. I'm not <laughs> sure yet. Um so if it's in statute as an allowable, an allowable place to spend these resources, and if these are all allowable under the settlement agreement, which they are, um, it doesn't require, I guess my question is, it's not requiring us to spend it in all of these areas. We, for instance, could say, oh, Vermont already provides MAT to people in correctional facilities, so we don't need to do that with these funds. We can instead prioritize you know, pregnant moms or something. Is that, I'm seeing nods from Ms. Hutt. So these are allowable, but it doesn't mean that we must do it in these areas. And I don't know if there's something in legislation, I mean, in the settlement agreement or whether there would be, whether everyone would agree with this. We could put language in that you, that this can't be used to, su to su supplant existing right. funding. Interest. Yeah. No. I think well, that why yeah, would we want to restrict it? You're saying put language in to not allow it to be used to um to to think to I mean just using Teresa's example that and we were able to substitute money from the settlement agreement because that was a given use. We could take the money we had allocated and spend it somewhere else. Uh, yeah, you could. Okay, all right. That's what I'm saying. Oh, and you would like that. Oh, that's what I did. Madam Chair, uh, my point was I don't. I wouldn't want to restrict the use of those federal funds to not okay. plant state funds. I guess that was okay. the point I was trying to make. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I was just trying to um, ask the question, which I think I got the answer that I understand. So. Mm -hmm. Um, the the committee, the advisory group, will be able to consider expenditures in any of these areas, and they should also consider what's already being spent in some of these areas when they are allocating or recommending resources to the commissioner mm -hmm. for expenditure of these funds. Right, and, yeah. they may, and they may find out that some of what we're doing is being um, supported by five-year federal grants that are going to disappear. Right. And that we've right. had them for the last 20 years, but we're not going to now. Right, and, right. Um, Representative McFawn. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the reason I bring it up is you were asking, who, do, we, do we need to hear from anybody else? And the way this piece of legislation now is drafted, it says that treating inca the incarcerated population. And it, it's very specific. It, 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 under A and B, it's telling you, this is what you're gonna do. That's, and so if, we, if it was gonna stay that way, and we we're gonna use this fund money to do that instead of the state money, then I would think we would have to have somebody from the corrections department to come in and, and we should talk to them. Because it's very prescriptive here. Right, it's one of the very specific um, right. possibilities. It, um, uh, Representative Fawn, I'm looking at these as um, a buffet table. <laughs> and there's a lot of choices out there. And, um, but I really don't like meat. So I'm only gonna take all the vegetarian options. <laughs> and all the options are out there, but I don't have to take them all. That's, but, um, as I started to try to explain it in a different way, 
Uh, I noticed that uh, Legislative Council looked like she was going to say something. So do correct me. <laughs> no, I, I don't want to correct you. I just thought that it might be useful if I um, talk a little bit about how subsection B and C fit together. Um, yes. So they're, they're both sort of, well, let me start with B. So B is saying this is sort of the allowable expenses. This is what you can spend the money on. But then subsection C, which is the really detailed subsection, um, goes into priorities. And those priorities are very specific. But even if something isn't on the priority list, but you're still seeing that it fits within one, you know, the universe of subsection B of allowable expenses, then that is still something that the advisory committee could recommend to draw down funds for. Does that help? Does that help, Topper? No, well, it, it makes what you said make sense to me. Um, I, I'm just, my whole thing, who do we want to talk to? If, if, if the bill is going to go through this way, then I think we need to talk to the corrections people. Because a piece of legislation is a bit different than an advisory council making recommendations. Thank you, Topper. Uh, Re uh, Representative McFawn. Um, this, 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 um, as we were going with these questions and um, it leads me to revise a bit that we will be um, spending time on this um, and on, on the Tuesday that we get back, um, and so um, I'm sort of, people have their schedules out. If the chief prevention officer could have her schedule out <laughs> and we will, um, um, if, um, uh, and we will invite uh, Josh Diamond and if um, uh, Ms. Hutt could, could reinforce the importance of him and if not him, someone else from the office who can talk about answer our questions if we have them, when we have them. Um, and uh, we'll have, I think we will have been away for a while. We'll have a walkthrough of the bill, of, of, the, of the strike all amendment. And um, we will uh, hear from some of the folks we need to hear from or review their letters. And we will continue the discussion on Wednesday and um, hopefully vote and vote it out Wednesday morning. But so rather not try to do it on, on Tuesday. Yeah. Can I just ask, a, did, did we say that we wanted to hear from someone on the Substance Misuse Prevention Oversight and Advisory Council? Or, or hasn't that not been? Prepared? No, I think that's, that's we will need to hear um, from the Say the title. Of <laughs> the I was impressed. Oh, she's reading. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. Was <laughs> you said the long meeting. The long meeting. We that long the discussion a lot, but we didn't specifically say we wanted to hear from them. But it seems like we ought to. Um. So thank you. I think we are at a place where um, I will circle back. Um, uh, to Ledge Council um, and to um, Ms. Hutt um, by phone or whatever. And um, I think this was a good place for us to stop um, on this um, today. And thank you both very much.